Thank you so much, guys. I'm so excited to be here. and so excited to talk about this topic. I'm going to try to share my screen. And if you've been teaching like I have over COVID and everything else, you know that's not always as easy as it sounds. So it looks like, um, like we're moving and grooving here. So we want to talk to you guys about the days of power sports marketing and give you a historical view of one of the most influential platforms in the world. And I, I really think the most influential marketing platform out there. And then maybe by the time we're done, you'll, you'll agree with me. But what we want to do in this session is just not talk about the power sport. So I forgot, I, I added a slight last minute. I, I thought I would reintroduce myself, but, but Paul did such a great job. There's really nothing um, else for me to say. In fact, Paul did such a great job. I, I will place recording back and ask my wife to hear how important Paul uh, made me sound. Um, so what we want to focus on are a couple of questions, a couple of questions. And that is, should sports and politics mix? Should players just show up and play? Should I even broach any of this in my class? And how is this, all this really related to sports marketing? So I'll, I'll, I'll start with the third question, which is, should I even broach any of this in my class? I'm a true believer that students come to college to develop their minds and to get a worldview that's greater than what they had before they got there. I truly believe that if students leave the university with knowledge from a textbook, but they haven't changed in some way or form as an individual, then we have educated the fellow. them. If you're conservative, when you leave college, you should be more liberal. If you're a liberal, when you leave college, you should be a little more conservative. You, you, you should grow in some way, shape, or form. That's just my, my personal belief. So I want students to look at the world and understand the world and experience the world when they come into my classroom. Now, that being said, it is not my job, and I tell my students this all the time, it is not my job, it's not my goal, it's not my, my, my secret agenda to get students to think like me. I don't want them to think like me. I just want them to think, right? So should you broach this in your class? I think you should, because I don't think you talk about sports and not integrate or see the impact it has on our society and, 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 and culture in our culture um, at large. So you have to talk about sports. And so we'll come back to these other questions a little bit later on, but I really want to go ahead and broach that one. Now, before we go any further, before we go any further, I want to um, do a little icebreaker. A little, do a little icebreaker. And um, well, I'll ask you guys to do, I don't have my chat on. I promise you, I don't have my chat on. What I'll ask you guys to do is think about your favorite sport and your favorite sports team. If you don't have one, that's fine, just zero. Think about your favorite sport and your favorite sports team. I'll give you a second to get that, kind of like let, let that sink in a little bit. That marinate. Some of you guys are going, you know, Lakers, Celtics. No, no, no. Just, just, just choose the one. Your favorite sport and your favorite sports team. Now, give me a thumbs up when you have it. All right. I got one thumbs up. Are you guys like my students? Are you, are you texting right now? Okay, now that you've got your favorite sport and your favorite sports team, I want you to go in the chat. I'm not going to look, I promise you. I want you to go in the chat, and I want you to just type in the age that became your favorite sport and your favorite sports team. And give me a thumbs up when you're done. Okay. I don't know if my internet's moving slow or if the thumbs are just coming slow. All right. So I, I still haven't looked at the chat, but I'll go ahead and tell you guys the answer and the significance of this. Our cultural background 
dictates what sports we're fans of, right? That background includes everything from our geography to people in our reference group, friends and family. That will dictate what sport you're a fan of. And the average person has picked their favorite sport and their favorite sports team by the, si by the time they're 12 years old. Now, I'm going to open the chat now and see if I'm right. I got 10, 15, 50. I don't believe you're 50, Tammy. So I'm not paying attention. 51, 20, 25, 10, below 10, 20, 5 or 6, 8, 6, college. So I'm going to say 25. I'm going to say 20, 20 um, 5, 27, 6, 18, 5. Right? All right. So we might be a little over 12. I don't know. Might be a little bit over 12 for this group. Normally, normally when I do this, it comes in around eight. And those of you who may have picked your favorite sport and sports team later, I am wondering, I'm questioning if you moved. If you had a big move and you had to relocate and you had to relocate your sports team, your, 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 your sport of preference and your team of preference. Totally agree with that. All right. Well, so the, the, the point of that is just to start you thinking about the role sports plays in your life. For so many of us, sports is an escape. For so many of us, it's an obsession. For others of us, it's, it's a simple distraction, right? But sports is really important to the majority of people. In fact, as I said earlier, I believe sports is the most powerful platform on the planet next only to maybe religion. So what we want to do today is give a, a historical review of the political importance of sports. Get into that question, should sports and politics mix? Explain how our attitudes and beliefs lead to our behaviors, to what we will accept or not accept in sports. And explain the role that sports can play in the formation of these attitudes and beliefs. And when we do all that, hopefully you'll, you'll agree with me the, about the importance of sports as a platform, and then we'll transition to how this really relates to marketing of other things outside of just sports themselves, right? So I will suggest to you, I will posit that sports can advance political dogmas. Sports can bring about societal change. It can promote unity. It can plant seeds of division, stop wars, elevate a nation's status, and actually change cultural practices. Now, some of you right now are saying, okay, that's a tall order, Dr. Bennett. That's a, that's, that's a big burger, Dr. Bennett. I don't know if I can swallow all that. Just give me a second. We're going to kind of walk through the historical importance that sports plays. In doing so, let me provide a caveat. That being that there are so many examples of how sports is weaved into our culture, how it's so important in our culture, how it can do all these things. I can't pick all of them, but I try to grab some favorites, right? I try to grab some favorites. So let's kind of go through a couple. Saying that sports can be a part of politics. And the thing is, sports are so important to us and so important to our culture, they provide a platform to grab our attention, to, to share ideas, even bad ones, right? So how important are sports? There's a thing called the sacred truth. In ancient Greece, during the Olympics, the whole city would, city would send runners out. And those runners would go across the land and announce the Olympics were starting. And what would happen is the city states that were at war would actually stop war. They would have a ceasefire or a cease sword, so that or a cease spear, so that the 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 athletes and the travelers they call them, which we would now call fans, could travel safely to the Olympic Games and back home. Sports can stop wars. During the um the, the Nazi Olympics, 1938 Nazi Olympics, 
Hitler wanted to use the Olympics to be a platform to promote his dogma that there was a master race and the strength of Germany. In fact, you can see the person here who I believe is in the third place is given the Nazi salute, which you can't see the man, the black suit to your far left is also given the salute and everyone in the stands, they're given the Nazi salute. Now the National Holocaust Museum credits Jesse Owens, who won, I believe it was 12 medals for single-handedly debunking and, and derailing that dogma. The Black Fist Salute. In 1968, two African-American athletes, well, let me take a step back. African-American athletes were going to protest and not be a part of the 1968 Olympics. And it got down to a point where half were gonna run and half were not gonna run. And so the ones who were, who were I shouldn't say run, participate, realize that well, if we don't participate, they'll just they'll fill our position with someone else and we will not have a chance to have made a, um, a statement. So at the event, two African-American runners decided, or sprinters, decided they would wear the Olympic Human Rights Project um, patch and that they would do the salute with two gloved black fists in silent protest. Unfortunately, one of them left his black gloves. So Peter Norman, who came in second place, said, why don't you each wear one glove on each fist? And they said, Peter, will you want to go out here with us? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to um, protest. And he said, yes, I'll go out with you. He put on the patch and went out with them. And they did the Black Fist salute, and they were booed. And they were um, forced to leave the Olympic Village and not participate in the Olympics anymore. And these gentlemen were vilified for a long, long time. What's often missed is that not only did they raise a Black Fist for Black power, not mean Black is more powerful, but mean Black is equal. They also popped their collars to support blue collar workers. They didn't wear shoes. If you notice, they have on black socks with no shoes to show solidarity with the homeless. And one wore a uh, um, necklace around his neck to pay respect to those who had been lynched during and after slavery. They made a powerful statement. They used this platform to grab the world's attention something that only sports can really do. Which brings us to the Munich Massacre, 1972. Now, before you say anything, I'm gonna say, I remember the Munich Massacre watching a documentary about it when I was about 12 years old. Yeah, you guys are gonna say, hey, how old were you? It's 1972, watch it now, slow, slow your roll. But the thing about the Munich Massacre is that I said before, sports, can be used as a platform to grab attention, even for the worst ideas. And there was a group, Black September, who went into the Olympic Village in Munich, killed two Israeli athletes, actually one athlete and one coach, and took over their apartment with more athletes as prisoners. And the entire world watched, and the entire world held their breath as they heard about their demands, to do sports of the platform to get their point across, to convey their message. The whole world watched, the whole world held their breath. And late in the evening, as the guys had asked for a helicopter and they took the hostages to a helicopter in an airfield, the German police sprang a trap. And late in the evening, The news came out that all of the kidnappers, the terrorists were killed and the hostages were safe. And I'll tell you, the 12 year old boy watching this sometime after the event had happened, I could not change the course of that event. 
I can wait with bated breath to find out what happened, but it wasn't actually happening. It already transpired years before. I was glued to that screen. I, I was I was I was tied to those players, to Mark Spence and the other other athletes. And then it was announced that the report was wrong. And that before one of the terrorists passed, he threw a hand grenade into the helicopter. And the entire world weeped. And the entire world mourned together loss of heroes that weren't even originally theirs. Doesn't happen when you go to see Harry Potter. Sticking with the theme of the Olympics, the North Korea Olympics was used as a platform to show the power and the wealth of a nation for a nation to save themselves, not just North Korea, they're not the only ones who've done it, to say we are a world power. We belong. It's like when someone gets out of college or when someone gets a good enough job and they go and buy a BMW, they're saying, hey, look at me, I made it. That's what countries do in order to host the Olympics. They're saying we have a place at the table. We have a ride. Look at us. You cannot look down on us anymore. We are your equal. We also have the Olympics, right? So sports should grab us. It can change us. Now I told you guys I just grabbed a couple of these, some of my favorites, some of my favorites. I'll try to go, I'll try to not go too slow, but some, some of these kind of grab me and I, I got to talk to you about them. You're probably all familiar with Title IX, 1976, the Yale women team, women's rowing team had to wait on the bus because their facilities did not have adequate spaces and places for them to take showers. So they had to wait on the bus for the men to finish showering first and then go into the men's locker room. Now, Title IX was was, was formulated, was, was, was put in, into effect in 1972 to guarantee there would not be any gender-based discrimination in schools. So the women's rowing team stripped down to their birthday suits and wrote Title IX all over their bodies and stormed the AD's office and demanding equal rights. And that's when Title IX took on this, this broader meaning that we're more used to today to make a change or to guarantee equal footing for women in sports it was not the original intent. The Battle of the Sex of 1973. I got to tell you guys, I'm a little excited to talk about these two things because in the book, uh, uh, another author, uh, Jerry Matos, uh, got to write about um, women's, women in sports. We have a whole chapter on that. And so I didn't get a chance to, 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 to put input um, on this top, on these topics or, or tell these stories. So it's been a little while since I've got a chance to, 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 to spin yarn about these. But in 1976, there was a gentleman named Bobby Riggs, who was someone of a showman, but also a, a ranked tennis player. He was getting a little older. And he challenged Billie Jean King to a tennis match. And he, he, he pushed a chauvinistic, um, angle to it. And Billie Jean King declined. He played another woman tennis star and beat her handedly and touted that men were the mo more dominant sex. And so Billie Jean King took the mantle and she did not just beat him. She absolutely destroyed him. But it was, it was a watershed moment for women everywhere. It was we are your equal in every single way, everywhere, right? So I'll just give you guys a couple more of these. Um, there is, if you ever get a chance to get your hands on it, um, I, I, I normally open up my class the first or second day with this video. The video is like an hour and five minutes long. So you've got an hour and 15 minute class. You, you, gotta, you gotta start it as soon as the class starts. It's a video, um, a documentary called Breaking the Huddle, the Integration of College Football. And I start this class because it tells so many stories like the ones we're telling right now, but all inside college football. 
and I, I've been teaching it. This, this, I've been teaching sports marketing with this video since 2005 or 2006. And the video tells some very eye opening stories. For, for example, the University of Kentucky was one of the first to integrate its college football team in the, in the SEC. And this was the late 60s, this wasn't, this wasn't like the 50s or the 40s. And the first two freshmen, you cannot play football back then in your freshman year. The first two freshmen, one of them during practice, when um, he had the ball and the whistle was blown, the entire team dog out on him, took him blindsided him and just tackled him to the ground. He later died from his injuries. There's lots of stories like that. There are lots of stories of heroes, lots of stories of sorrow. But one of the, the, the main stories is that the University of Alabama had been a national powerhouse, but because they would not play integrated teams like Michigan and Michigan State, and they would not leave the South or the Southeast to play, they stopped winning national championship. Now, remember again, your, your national championship is going to be um, decided at that time by reporters. So if they can't see you play other powerhouse teams and other conferences, then you won't be able to um, move up. Now, the reason why this story is one of my favorite stories, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on when we get to attitudes and, and beliefs. The reason why this story is one of my favorite stories is because the, the citizens, the fan base in Alabama were die hard supporters of the football team never being integrated. And, and Bear Bryant even said, you know, I won't, I won't be the first to integrate, but I won't be the third. And one year they added an extra football game to everyone's season. And so Bear Bryant called up the coach at the University of Southern California and asked if they would come to Alabama and play. And so they came and played, and this team had an all-black backfield. Quarterback, halfback, fullback, unheard of in the day. And they put in a, 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 a freshman, or I think it was a redshirt freshman, named Sam Cunningham. Sam Cunningham got 150 yards in the first half. 150 yards, in case you're not familiar, is great for an entire game. They beat Alabama so handedly. The next day in all the diners, the only talk was how do we get some of those colored boys like USC has? We need those guys on our team. In one night, people's attitudes and opinions were changed about race, about inclusion because of sports, right? Sports and apartheid. Um, Nelson Mandela says sports have the power to change the world. They have the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little other things have. Sports have the power to change the world. So that's on there twice. I don't know why. And the reason why he's saying that is because, because of the practice of apartheid. And again, there, there's so many different uh, leagues in, in South Africa and, and, and the timeline between the 50s at the end of apartheid, there's a lot of ebb and flow of who was restricted and who wasn't. But a lot of important sports to that nation, notably cricket and rugby, the South African teams were not allowed to participate and move towards national championships or international championships, rather, because of the political dogma of the day. And so the, the, the want of the minority white South Africans to take pride in their national teams actually, again, opened up softened hearts, changed minds, right? In ping pong diplomacy, you guys probably all know of this. Uh, they, they had um, been a sitting president to visit China. China actually closed its borders I believe over 14 years um, when a Chinese ping pong player invited an American ping pong player to ride on their bus when he missed his. And then they invite the, the American ping pong team to China. 
the Chinese people on team came to America. And then um, Henry Kissinger went um, unannounced to the public to visit China and open um, the doors for backwater talks between Nixon and the Chinese government until Nixon was the first sitting president to visit China. And Nixon said, I had never expected that the Chinese initiative would come from a ping pong team. But again, sports is, so the other thing about sports is it's, it's this universal language, right? It's something we all understand, we all speak. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, go somewhere in the next couple of days. Actually, actually go somewhere tonight. I believe, I believe the Stanley Cup is playing tonight. Go to a sports bar tonight that's playing the Stanley Cup. Pick a team. The fans of that team will now be your family. They'll, they'll be your friends. For those three quarters, or I shouldn't say three quarters, three periods of hockey. Right? So what's all the hubbub? Why is sports so influential? Sports is the cornerstone of our culture. It reflects our culture. It creates a platform for changing attitudes. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to trying to move the picture of all your lovely faces so I could uh, see my slides. It changes attitudes and beliefs. It helps create new ones. And 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 just review attitudes or evaluations of objects, people, groups, issues, actions that can range from negative to positive and beliefs are convictions that we hold to be true. Now this is important because attitude and beliefs are predictors of behavior. And they're also very salient and difficult to change. But we've seen, are you, I've told you of, about instances where people's attitudes change, where they're willing to take one step forward or in some cases one step back based on the importance of sports. And so before I jump into this slide about, about um, the, 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 the theory of, of planned behavior, I just wanna say that there's two things about sports that I wanna make sure I, I make clear. One, sports is important to us. So as, as in the example with Alabama, that importance makes us willing to change our attitudes and beliefs. Right. And the other is that while sports is important, the heroes and the messages that are conveyed through sports also can become important. Right. Sports is, is something that's very important to us. And as such, it provides this platform that allows us or allows um, messages to convey to us. So I'm going to take you guys through the theory of planned behavior. I'm sure like 99.95 of you are super familiar with it. It's one of my, my favorite um, little doodads because um, uh, uh, about uh, 12 years ago when I was doing my um, PhD, I had a chance to take class with Eric Eisen. And um, it was very interesting, very eye-opening. And I, I learned a lot uh, more about this, this theory um, than I had previously believed there was to know. So the theory of planned behavior gets in the, in, into our behavior being driven by our intentions, right? And those intentions are going to be driven by our attitudes with behavior, subjective norms, perceived behavior control. Perceived behavior control are driven by control beliefs, what we think we can and can't do, what we think we do or don't have access to. Normative beliefs, what we think other people believe about something. And behavioral beliefs, our, our own, own belief. But the interesting part, and the part that I probably didn't pay attention to as much till I got um, in, into um, Dr. Ivan's class. The interesting part is that there are these background factors that affect all those beliefs, which in turn drive those attitudes, right? So what do we mean by that? We've got these background factors like age and gender, education, income that affect our beliefs. Now, the thing that's not here that we add in the book and that I want, to, I want to present to you guys is that sports is such an important part of everything we do, who we are, right? That sports will be interpreted by our background factors, 
and also will have effect and input into some of those background factors. Now, right now, you're going, Dr. Bennett, I, uh, I told you this was a big burger. You got to give me something to drink with that one. I'm going to kind of walk you guys through these background factors. And, and, and I'll ask you some questions. So I'm, I, know, I know we said we'd ask questions at the end, but I'll ask you some questions. Feel free to, to just mic on for a second and give me a response. But I'm going to start with age. Age is a background factor that affects our beliefs and therefore our attitudes because age is really a, a, a collection of our lived experiences. And those lived experiences shape who you are. Now, I'm going to tell you guys, um, my father, he's no longer with us. But some years ago, oh, man, maybe. I won't say how many years ago, but we'll just say I was in my 20s. Um, I had a video game where you could make yourself a boxer and you fought boxing legends. And my father, who loved boxing, thought this was the coolest thing in the world to watch me box people. <clears throat> And you can make your avatar look like you. So as I'm boxing, as I'm boxing, I, I beat Mike Tyson. My dad goes crazy. He to get the next one. I, I, I beat Sugar Ray Leonard. My dad goes crazy. He's like, get the next one. They bring in Muhammad Ali. Because of my father's age, boxing means more to him than it does in my generation. In particular, Muhammad Ali, get a little bit into reference groups now, we'll go back to that later. Muhammad Ali means a lot to him. My father was on his feet cheering on a fake Muhammad Ali to beat me up. And it was, it was more than ha ha, I want Muhammad to beat you. He was like, get him, champ, get him. He transformed, he went back to when he was a young kid watching Muhammad Ali on TV or listen to the file on the radio. That's how age of the background factor affects his beliefs, his attitude, his behavior towards Muhammad Ali. Gender. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump forward because I can't see the time. I'm a little afraid that I'm going I'm to run over. I'm going to jump for it um, just to say that gender and all these other background factors contribute to our beliefs and our attitudes and our action in one of three ways when it comes to sports. They give us reference, reference groups being those people we aspire to be like or out groups we don't want to be like. They give us rules. As my practical state, they're showing us the model of what we can and can't do, what is and what is not acceptable. Every Five-year-old boy knows that when he slam dunks on his Fisher-Price basketball, he's supposed to hang onto the rim and stick his tongue out because he's been, he's, been, he's been given the rules of what to do by the people in his reference group, and they provide us access. With gender, there are still boundaries that are being pushed, that are being expanded, that are being explored. If you grew up, in a household, traditional household, that, that looked at assessed gender, female in a certain way, football was probably never, ever pushed towards you, introduced towards you. Probably not, you weren't asked to go outside and throw the piece getting around by, by, by one of your parents, simply because of your gender. So just to run through these really quickly, um, education and income kind of go hand in hand. I, I tell students all the time, your income has a big impact on what sports you'll like, and what sports you'll play. And if you don't believe me, I just want someone to think how much it costs to play golf. Shoes, green fees, for God's sake, lessons. Glove. If you've ever played golf without a glove, you probably only did it one time. Right? You got to get those funky pants, cart fee. How much does it cost to play basketball? How much does it cost to play baseball? 
And don't get me started on show jumping or polo. Nothing wrong with these things, but there are economic boundaries to keep people out. All right. For the sake of time, I'll jump down. Um, I, I, I'll just grab one or two quick ones. If we get one ask me a question, I'll go back to some others. Geography, where you live dictates what sports you are, you have affinity to. I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina. I grew up in the middle of, of families that were either, whether they went to the school or not, UNC, Duke, NC State, or Wake Forest. And you got to pick one. You cannot be out there on an island. You have to have a team, right? Geography. Also, geography dictates what sports we'll participate in. If you live on a beach, you probably surf. If you live in the mountains, you probably don't. If you live in the mountains, you probably ski. If you live on the beach, you probably don't, right? So all these things feed into our behaviors, beliefs, attitudes, known beliefs, and subjective norms. I talked about reference groups earlier. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and jump past that. So this gets us into, should we talk about sports and politics? Now, going back over the example I gave you so far, I hope you all go ahead and agree that sports and politics are always intertwined because politics always have a message and sports always provide the platform. They're always intertwined. But when we get into sports and politics, what I try to talk my students, tell my students is let's look at sports and politics through the theory of planned behavior. And let's understand based on people's background factors why they might see things a certain way. I also remind them that we're always living in a snapshot and that the arc of the universe is long, but it, it eventually slightly bends towards justice. So my picture here is Muhammad Ali, one uh, an homage to my father, but also because Muhammad Ali is one of those figures who, who, who didn't shut up and play. He was drafted to, to go fight in the Vietnam War. He said he was against it. And to this day, there are people who resent that. But if you look at their background factors, it makes sense. Are they from a military family? Do they have a loved one who served in Vietnam? Do they have people in their reference group, those subjective norms, who believe or normative beliefs that what Muhammad Ali did was wrong. He was stripped of his title for three years, couldn't fight. When he did fight, that's why you had the, the rumble in the jungle, the thrill in Manila, Manila, he had to go elsewhere to fight, right? So the, the, the question isn't, is it right or is, is it wrong? It's why do people think it's right or wrong? And we look at people's attitudes and beliefs and go through the theory of planned behavior, go through Muhammad Ali being a hero for my father, we can understand why he might think that way. Now, I know our time is short, but I want to tell you guys one of my favorite sports stories in the world. I feel like, am I giving you guys all sad stories? There's some great sports stories. It's sad boy hour, though. One of my favorite sp sports stories is that of Peter Norman. Now, we talked earlier about um, the two African-American uh, sprinters, 200-meter run, that um, helped the Black Fist, and Peter Norman told them to share the gloves and walked out with them and wore the patch. Peter Norman was ruined for that. All he did was a silent protest by going out with them because he felt that there was apartheid against Aborigines or Aboriginal people in, in, in um, his home country. He wanted to, to show solidarity and support. So Peter Norman was ruined after that. Peter Norman... I'm sorry, no one ever calls me. That's my wife's phone. Peter Norman um, was ruined. Peter Norman qualified 11 times for 200 meter and five times for another event and was never allowed to race for Australia. He ended up um, working in a butcher shop. His time in the 1968 Olympics was so good, it's still the Australian record for 200 meter. And actually, if he would have run that race in 2000, he would have won the gold. Speaking of 2000, in 2000, they invited all living Olympians to come back and walk through Olympic Village with their, their, their country's teams and wear their medals. 
Peter Norman was not invited by Australia. In fact, the two African American runners for America invited him and took money. He came and walked with the American team. Those two runners also were his pallbearers in 2006. And the reason why I bring up Peter Norman when I talk to my students and we go through people's, people's background factors and their thoughts and their age and their culture and why were they so upset with Peter Norman? And they kind of get an understanding, not if it's right or if it's wrong, not if I'm right or they're wrong, but they kind of start to think. And then I ask them to think some more. I'm not asking you to think like me. I'm not asking you too much right or wrong. I'm asking you to think about people's background factors and what influences them. Because sports is always going to be a platform and there's always going to be a message. Which one you adhere to, which one you gravitate to is going to be dictated in some degree by your background factors. And if you know that, you can step back and ask yourself what is and what isn't right. So I'll end with this. The sports is it's energetic. It's crazy. It's wild. I, I apologize. I want to talk about rivalries and, and, and about tribalism, too. Maybe we'll do that on, on the 15th a little bit. But sports is, it grabs us, it holds us, it molds us. It grabs our attention like nothing else. I love this picture here. The guy said, today's supposed to be my wedding day. She made me choose her or Notre Dame. Where is he at? Notre Dame. He probably made a good choice for her, too. But we won't go there. We won't go there. Right? And the reason why I bring all this up in class, the reason why I get that last, that last question, is this related to marketing? I mean, we're getting into, into some consumer behavior stuff. We get into the theory of plan behavior. But how does this relate to marketing? Ladies and gentlemen of the congregation, I submit to you, that if sports can change our attitude and our beliefs, which are very salient and, 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 and enduring, if they can change our attitudes and our beliefs about things like politics, about things like race, gender, sexual orientation, if sports can change our attitudes and beliefs about things like that, it can definitely change our attitudes and beliefs about soda and clothes, about Toyota and Nissan. It is, without a doubt, one of the most powerful platforms in the world. And I argue again, second only